All right, guys, thank you all for joining us today. This is being recorded. One thing I mentioned at the beginning of every single webinar is watch this again. Maybe not just this short call webinar because your questions really drive this. And uh, therefore, maybe watch another short call one because people have other questions as well uh, that we've answered throughout. And um, that's because I want to make sure you guys are all clear our concept before this. So don't be shy about asking a question throughout this webinar. I'm going to answer those. And if you have a question, somebody else probably has that same question as well. So, um, you know, feel free to throw that out there. How are you doing, Ted's in the house? All right. So this is on a short call. All right. And this is when we have a bearish bias. Now, one thing that we were kind of chatting about before this webinar uh, with a friend of mine was, you know, there's people out there that believe that if you have a bearish bias in something, all you, all you do is go out there and buy puts. Well, that's just enough to get you guys in trouble because if you're doing that or setting that up in the wrong environment or at the wrong time, then, or in the wrong duration, you know, all of those things can really come back to haunt you. And I, that's what I'd go through with the short call. I mean, obviously you can go online and figure out how to do a short call. It's not that difficult, but I talk about the environment, the duration, strike location, and all of those things uh, in order to increase your probabilities of success. And I think that you will see the logic behind all of this as we go through this webinar. And all of a sudden you'll, you'll start realizing, yeah, there is a time and a place for all of these different strategies. But let me get a couple of things out of the way real quick for some of you guys who haven't watched any of my webinars before. I'm Eric Wilkinson. And yes, you may recognize me from mainstream media. Uh, I, I used to chat with Rick Santilli down there and even uh, Jeff Kilberg, uh, who's on there quite a bit now, about economic, geopolitical, and market analysis, things of that nature. Uh, I actually started out trading in college with a psychology degree and switched it over to finance after graduating from college. I immediately packed my bags and moved to Chicago. And in that time, I've traded everything from stocks, financial futures, commodities, currencies, and options on all these products in just about all market conditions. And this disclaimer we got to go over, basically any opinions, news, research, and analysis, or anything I talk about is general commentary. and does not constitute investment advice. I'm trying to teach you guys how to implement this stuff into your portfolio in your own way. Uh, I don't want you to just watch my daily market commentaries where I talk about all my trades and just jump on board with that because for one, it might be outside your risk parameters to do so. And two, uh, you may not have the same directional assumption I have. You might make better calls than me, who knows? Uh, so past performance of any trading system or methodology is not necessarily indicative of future results. All right, you can follow me on Twitter at Wolfman's blog or our parent company at Pro Trader Strap for hopefully market wisdom out of me, but you'll definitely get some of that from Pro Trader Strat and uh, some extra deals that I may not uh, be tweeting out. Also, follow us on uh, Facebook at Pro Trader Strategies. We're putting out a lot of content on Facebook, so I know some of you guys have uh, talked about, hey, I didn't get that webinar that I watched, you know, in the email. Well, if you're following us on Facebook, then those are getting thrown out there. So uh, you can you can watch them there as well. All right. This is again on the short call. It is going to come with a bearish assumption. Now you need to have pretty much a bearish assumption with this. Like you want to go into this knowing it's not going to go, you know, parabolic or vertical on you. You could get away with having a relatively market neutral assumption. If you guys uh, watch those daily market commentaries, you know that I, I basically did the short puts on gold just a couple of days ago, and it didn't really rally that much, but um, you know I had a bullish assumption on it and did the short puts on that strategy or on that uh, underline, just the same that I'm gonna be talking about with this short call. As a matter of fact, I think we might be able to find something in gold to uh, do the short call with. So a little bit of heads up there. All right, we're going to be taking advantage of theta decay. We want to make sure that we get into a duration with the most theta decay. And we want volatility to come out of that. Now, with my gold trade, I actually didn't get a whole lot of volatility 
immediately coming out of it, but there was a little bit of volatility that came out and that obviously helped. You know, my directional assumption helped as well too. But volatility, we want to come out of this. So kind of a, you know, we want shorter duration on the theta decay and we want volatility crush. We want that stuff to slam out of there. That's really where you make your money. It's not really on theta decay. Theta decay is just a, a little bit like um, erosion, if you will. All right. So picking the right underlying. What I talk about with this one is that if it is a stock that is um, less than $100, this is pretty easy. If we are looking at a stock that is less than $100, oops, then we need it to be equal to or less than 10 cents. I'm just going to do a cent sign. 10 cents from the bid to the offer. All right. And I'll show you what I mean by that here in a second. Let me pull up my platform. Oh, it's over here. Give me a second. Pull it over here. So when we go over here to look at the option montage, this stock is under $100. So what we could look, do is easily look over here at the option montage. We got Apache. So we want to say it's under $100. And I said it needs to be less than 10 cents wide, all right, from the bid to the offer, all right? So we go down here to these duration, the ones that are the spot months, all right? Um, and we wanna look at the spot month there because this is where the most time and volume is being spent. This is where all the eyeballs are. If I could do some eyeballs real quick, you know, that's where everybody's kind of looking, you know, got their eyes staring at it. All right, so less than 10 cents wide to the bid offer. We're looking at these options that are just out of the money and you can see it's 110 bid at 114 and 48.53. Uh, that's inside of that rule. Now, if we're going to be looking at something that is over a hundred dollar stock, let's just go over to target. We simply move the decimal three ticks to the left. So one, whoops, let's pull up this and go one, two, three. So that's basically 11 cents is what I'm looking for for target down here in the options. And you can see that that fits that rule even after the close. And this rule, it's not filling it there, but uh, or there, there, or there it is. But this is during open market operations because you can imagine after the close, if I was uh, $4.35 bid over here, if I was $4.35, well, after the close, I'm not leaving that in there all night to just kind of wait to see what happens. That order will then get canceled, right? So then when we get that cancellation, oops, when we get that cancellation, you know, your order's not being represented anymore. So it's gonna look a little bit wider. So make sure when you're looking at this rule here uh, that it is something that is falling within that parameter, all right? Um, not all stocks are created equal. We don't, you know, with Biogen, it's a pretty good example of, you know, we move that decimal three ticks to the left, it should be about 27 cents and you can see uh, after the close, these get really wide, but it does not really fit that rule of thumb during open market operations either. So uh, if you watch the daily market commentaries, you know I've been staying away from Biogen. I'm not sure why the uh, bid offers are getting wider in there, uh, less people are participating. You can see they get a lot of good volume during the day. You would think that the options would represent that, but it hasn't lately. And another one is Priceline. When they switched over to booking.com, they lost a lot of options traders uh, with that new ticker symbol. So um, you will see them get rather wide, but just make sure you follow that rule during open market operations. Ulta is one that everybody's heard of. It usually fits that rule during open, op open market operations. Right now, after the close, it's not really fitting that rule. Um, but most stocks will, Procter & Gamble, will fit that rule rather easily, as you can see here. So that's what we're looking for on uh, picking the right underlying. If it's, like I said, if it's uh, greater than um, $100, we just move the decimal. Move the decimal. I'm going to have to run around out of room here. Move the decimal uh, three ticks to the left. All right. So that's what we're looking for for your picking the right underlying. And then the right environment here, all right? 
we're talking about, uh, actually, you know what? I'm not going to do that one. I'm going to do IV percent. All right. When I'm talking about environment, you ever hear me talking about environment? We're talking about IV percent, which is implied volatility. All right. Implied vol. All right. And what that is, is implied volatility. You know, you've heard of the VIX. We're not talking about the VIX. All right. The VIX will affect all the premiums in and around underlines, but not all of them will be, you know, affected the same. All right. So what we need to do is look at the implied volatility percent of X, Y, Z, whatever that stock is. And the easiest way to do that is you take the current, the current implied volatility, you subtract that by the low volatility or the low implied volatility, and you take that sum and divide it by the high IV minus the low IV, all right? So that's how we come up with implied volatility percent, okay? Now, if you're on Thinkorswim, they give it to you. It's, it's pretty easy to come up with. If you're on some of the other platforms, I'm not sure, uh, but what you'll need to do is maybe pull up a trading platform. They have charts on it, I'm sure, uh, to find out what the implied volatility is. I have it over here on my charts. Uh, just to give me a double check on it because sometimes there might be a break in the chart here and the algorithm can't come up with an exact number. I also have a buddy that basically will go only like six months out and uh, take a look at, whoops, you know, and only take it from here and go that way. So he'll take his numbers off of, you know, only six months out or so. Uh, he, he likes to have that shorter duration. He's like, I'm trading shorter duration. I want to make sure I'm staying with that. It also will have a tendency, like at the beginning of the year, we had this massive spike in volatility. Well, we might not see that kind of spike in volatility for another, um, you know, couple of years. So why have that being represented all of the time uh, is, is his theory. And the idea here, though, is that when we're looking at this implied volatility percent, the idea is that most stocks will stay in a trading range or in a, in a range for their volatility, you know, where Tesla, you know, we're looking at Procter and Gamble and we can see that the high in Procter and Gamble is probably about, you know, 0.35, where that might be the ultimate low in something like a tech stock or like Tesla. So what I'm talking about here with volatility is they all have their own volatility coefficient. So we need to know whether 17 is high or low for Procter & Gamble, all right? And Tesla will never get down to 17. <laughs> so, you know, you would always be looking at, well, okay, it's always high or something like that. So, or, or in regards to Procter & Gamble, it's always very low. But what this does is it tells us because we know that these volatilities kind of stay in line with each other, that, uh, you know, this might be high or low for uh, a particular underlying. Let's just go over to Tesla because I talked about it. You know, you can see right here, low, and we're at an all-time low in Tesla. You can see it's 0.74%, percent uh, which means that it is in the very lowest. It's just a shade off it's very low, all right? So um, somewhere in the 0.4 uh, is very low for that. Well, we could see that Procter & Gamble never even reached that even in back in that January where we had the massive spikes in volatility. So the idea here with IV percent, IV percent, we're just trying to figure out whether or not this mark right there is in the upper range or in the lower range, because it tells us our options, tells us what our options premiums are, either high or low. Are the options premium high or low? If it's way down here, okay, for Tesla, then that's telling me Tesla's premiums are basically the cheapest we have seen all year, all right? 
So if they're super cheap, I would not want to be trying to sell those because we can see with this chart here that because it's so low, I would have to assume that volatility is getting ready to start rising in Tesla. You can see it's just like a chart. It goes back and forth and nothing stays in the same place for very long. And I would almost assure you that volatility in Tesla is going to start expanding. So we would want to take advantage of something expanding in volatility. And if volatility expands, we know that the premiums are going to get inflated. So Tesla would not be something we would want to be selling calls or puts or any kind of premium selling strategy because that volatility coefficient will start working against us. And volatility right here tells us for every one percentage point increase in implied volatility, our premiums are going to increase by the Vega, right? So if Tesla has really low volatility right now, we can assume that volatility is going to go up. That means these cheap, these are really, really cheap premiums, despite the fact that they look very expensive, right? They're very cheap for what Tesla usually feels. Um, whereas we go up here and look at the high implied volatility, we can say that, um, let's just look at Coca-Cola. We could say that Coca-Cola, and we look at their chart, you can see that Coca-Cola is at its very high. My friend would say that it's almost at 100% with the took out this spike here, but um, we would say that right now, Coca-Cola has really expensive premiums in their options, all right? So every 1% decrease in this implied volatility, you know, we're gonna lose seven cents for every 1% decrease. And you can see that uh, the, the chart for here, when it was really low and started spiking, that difference was from 15, let's, yeah, let's call it around 15 all the way up to, you know, 24. So, you know, just for math, let's say it increased by 10 cents. That meant that these premiums from that low in those few days increased by 70 cents, all right? Very close to it, ballpark. We're assuming that the market didn't move, but you get my gist and volatility affects the options closer to, uh, the at the monies than they do the further out of the money. But we can say that, you know, they probably at least increased by 50 cents. So um, we want to play it where we can take advantage of that, where we're just trying to turn the tables in our favor. And, you know, that's one thing that I always talk about with the guys on TV is, you know, they, they don't know your risk parameters and stuff like that. So they always go with the very manila and say buy calls and sell, uh, buy calls and buy puts and stuff like that for directional assumptions. Well, to me, that's just crazy because, um, you know, you could get yourself set up right now to be buying calls or buying puts depending on your uh, directional assumption. And the market could see that volatility come out. And if the, it didn't go anywhere, you would have lost a ton of money. So in Coca-Cola, my thing for picking the right environment, this would be the right environment for something uh, to be premium selling strategies because my, my rule for picking the right environment is if the, if IV percent is greater than a 50, all right, a 50%, then that's when we're looking to sell premium strategies, okay? Um, for, uh, sorry, that's the wrong symbol. And I've got the wrong thing on there. So let me get my eraser because I did a less than sign. And I want to make sure uh, I do this right. Uh, so if it's greater than, we're looking for it to be greater than of IV percent of 50. And then we also, for an ETF, this is for, let's just call it XYZ for a stock. And for an ETF, then it, it needs to be greater than an IV percent of 30 because uh, like all, all ETFs have over like 25 stocks in them. Um, and all of those volatilities are going to be experiencing different types of volatility. 
And when you average out all of those, it ends up being a little bit lower. Uh, it doesn't mean it won't go up to 100%. It will, but it's very rare that it, it really starts spiking uh, massively on the ETFs. So usually I, I say with the ETFs, uh, greater than uh, 30 IV percent is fine. If you have a lower risk tolerance, you know, you might want to say, you know, for the lower risk tolerance, I'm going to, or starting with premium selling strategies, I want to go above 75 or something like that. And I want to go above 50 for these. Okay. Um, I don't have a problem with that. You know, just make sure it's greater than my minimums over here. All right. If you have a lower risk tolerance, if you're a little bit more used to trading options and feel like you have a higher risk tolerance then maybe follow my rules there. But uh, if this is going to be the first time you're selling a naked call, then maybe go with the, the extremes, you know, above 75 or something like that and above 50 for uh, ETF. All right. The right duration. We already talked about this duration. We want to take advantage of theta. Theta. All right. I think I spelled theta wrong. I'm having a brain cramp right now. And with that being said, uh, inside of 35 days to expiration is really the wheelhouse. And I like to stay inside of this area right here as well. Inside of seven days, you can say, look at that theta decay, Wolf, man. Why aren't you taking advantage of the weeklies and all of that stuff? For one, there's not a whole lot of money left over here. You know, we're talking, there is a lot of theta happening there, but... The fact of the matter is, is there's not a whole lot of premium in there and in order to lose. But we get somewhere, you know, my I like to go maybe inside of 45 days. So we say less than 45 days to expiration is kind of the sweet spot. Best is obviously inside of this 35 days. Uh, that's where you get a big drop in your premium, 50% drop. And I'm only looking to get in and out of these trades as quickly as I can, right? I don't I don't ride anything to zero. Um, if, if you watch the daily market commentaries, you know, I, I was looking to cover my GLD trade, which I ended up getting out of late in the day today, um, but it wasn't for a full boat. It wasn't for all of it. It was slightly better than my rule, uh, which is, we'll talk about here in a minute, but my rule is 50% of max profit. It was just slightly better than that. Coming into the day, it was right there at 50% of max profit. And I just kind of kept an eye on it throughout the day and um, ended up covering it. All right. So we want to get inside of less than 45 days to expiration because we get this massive theta uh, drag on our um, premiums there. So we can take a look at the uh, chart again and say that if we're looking at this here, go over, we talked about volatility every 1% decrease there. Well, theta every day that goes by and on the floor, easy way to remember what this theta is, is we used to call it the thief. And the theta is the thief in the night that comes and steals your premium. So you can see 36 days to expiration every single night on something you know that's $50, we're going to lose a penny every single night. Doesn't matter. Every night that goes by, that thief is stealing a penny from us, which is good. We want to try and get those um, premiums to get sucked out about as quickly as we can. All right. So we want to take advantage of that theta component. And the best way to do it is, you know, that one penny a day. If you go way out here in time, it's probably going to be close to a penny anyway there because it's such a small premium. But if we looked at something like, um, let's look at Lulu. Uh, Lulu, we could say, okay, move the decimal uh, three ticks, 21 cents. Is Lulu fitting that rule? You can see it fits that rule of 21 cents. But theta, every single night, 14 cents is coming out of this premium. So tomorrow, you can subtract it from the bid and the offer, and that's basically where this is going to be priced in if this didn't move a penny in either direction, okay? And volatility stayed exactly where it was. It's going to lose 15 cents or 14 cents every single night and the closer we get to uh expiration you can see that theta should start increasing of course they smack me in the face with that one theta is decreasing for some reason right there it's probably because uh the bid offer is a little bit 
thrown off the deltas and all of that stuff when the markets change, you know, off. But trust me, theta will start increasing. If we go out here in time, maybe that's going to be the better way to look at it. You can see that theta only get, comes out at about seven cents here. It's probably close to 10 cents here um, and then 14 cents. So you can see it actually does ramp up the closer to expiration there. Uh, theta starts picking up. So we wouldn't want, we want to take advantage of theta decay in ours. We wouldn't want to pick this duration. That's why I'm saying right inside that wheelhouse, inside of 45 days, 36 days, that's where we start really seeing theta get more and more aggressive as per this chart. And these are the at the monies, of course. So the theta, um, you know, the theta curve might be a little bit different from the strikes that we're going to be using because we're going to be doing the out of the money ones. But this just gives you an idea that the further out you go, um, theta is not really ticking away as much as it is. Once we get inside it, 35 days to expiration, it really starts accelerating. But I have absolutely no problem uh, doing it, you know, less than 45 days to expiration. The real sweet spot is coming up right now, though. All right, so picking the right strikes then. We got the duration, right? Uh, we got the right underlying. We said, you know, basically we're looking at uh, equal to or less than 10 cents, right? The environment we want um somewhere equal let's just call it equal to or less than 45 uh days to expiration the oh sorry that's the wrong environment uh sorry um let me erase that again see i start thinking getting ahead of myself there a little bit there um eraser let me get rid of all that all right so equal to or uh, picking the right environment. Uh, so we just want to have this be greater than, greater than IV, greater than 50 IV percent. All right. And for an ETF, it's going to be greater than 30. All right. That's for the ETF. And then the duration, we want less than 45 days to expiration. You know, these are the rule of thumbs. You know, if I always talk about this, uh, try to talk about this anyway, uh, when we're looking at, you know, a scenario where you've got your uh, street light, right? And we have a, a green light, a yellow light, and a red light kind of thing. You know, if one of these doesn't check off maybe that we're looking at an underlying and it's under it's less than a hundred dollars uh and let's say that the bid to the offer is 15 cents well if you've traded that a lot i would say that that would be a yellow light um and let's just say that then you had something that was uh less than 50 iv percent well then you'd have another yellow light if you get too many yellow lights then I would say that it is uh, a no-go kind of thing. If you're fitting all my rules, then then it's a it's a green light and you're good to go. Okay, so kind of think of it that way. These aren't hard rules that you have to like just to a T. I mean, if you have if you're newer to options trading, I would absolutely stick to these rules. I stick to these rules still to this day, and I probably have a higher risk tolerance than most people out there. All right. And picking the right strike, we're going to be looking at the 16 delta. All right. We're going to look at the 16 delta because of the probabilities. All right. We're going to look at the probabilities of something like, um, and we talked about this last week as well, you guys. And I actually started misspeaking towards the end of that webinar yesterday, but or last week. But right there, we're looking at one standard deviation. That's for the puts. We're going to actually be looking at the one standard deviation for the calls. The reason why this is a 16 delta is because delta really, is, you know, delta tells us a lot of things. And I've got floor trader hacks for that. Uh, but one thing with delta is, you know, it tells us how, you know, $1 change, you know, $1 increase 
or decrease changes our premium, okay? But it's also probabilities of being in the money, all right? And what that means is when you're looking at this bell curve, it means all of this over here is basically 84, sorry, 84% chance of happening, meaning it's gonna go this away from or stay inside of our mark. And if we're looking at this strike, which is like the 16 delta, the probabilities of all of this happening is 84% because the probabilities of all of this happening is 16%. So we're picking this strike location because there's only a 16% probability of our uh, short calls going in the money. There's only a 16% probability of them being in the money at expiration, right? Because if you add up 13.6 and 2.1 plus 0.1 plus, you know, basically 0.1, 0.1, 0.1 all the way out there, it's gonna basically add up to 16. You know, if you started talking about the four uh, uh, standard deviation and stuff like that. So we wanna be outside of there. 16% probability coincides with a 16 delta. Joining late, bearish duration, uh, calendar spread. No, we're doing the short call today. All right, so we're gonna be looking at the short call, the short call uh, that only has a 16% chance of being in the money, all right? All right, so knowing our exit strategy, I might've already mentioned this, uh, knowing the exit strategy, we are looking at getting out at 50% of max profit. All right, Fix, what's max profit? Well, max profit, anytime you're dealing with these types of strategies, your max profit is the premium received upon selling that. We're selling the 16 delta. So whatever you're, or at least as close to that 16 delta as you can. You know, one of those things I talked about, you know, one of the stocks I'm looking at, you know, if it's a 21 delta, you know, just know that that's going to be one of your yellow lights. So make sure all of your other uh, things in and around this strategy fits that rule. You know, if you're really bullish, then, you know, I don't have a problem going a little bit closer. Uh, if you're a little bit worried going a little bit further away. I used to be a hard line on this uh, 16 Delta. All right. But, um, you know, if you start going out like closer to that 11 Delta, you know, just say it's a yellow light, you know, cause you're not getting a lot of premium. But that had to do with um, us not making a lot of money on it because of commissions. And now that we don't have to pay commissions, you now I don't have a problem really going a little bit further out and not collecting, um, you know, the 16 Delta premium. 16 Delta premium usually ends up being, you know, um, for a $50 stock about, 30 cents, which is a nice um, premium to get at. But now if you're getting a 20 cent premium and uh, you got better probabilities and you don't have to pay the commissions, you know, it almost ends up being about the same. So not, you know, you can go a little further out. I wouldn't do it for like a nickel or anything like that, but um, then it's, you know, you're not getting a lot, you're not getting paid for some of that risk that you're incurring there. All right, your max loss though is unlimited, right? Because XYZ stock could cure cancer and it could go to uh, infinity and beyond. So just know that we aren't get, we're not gonna hold on to it that long, you guys. Uh, you know, it, find your, make sure like with your exit strategy, I said 50% of your um, max profit. All of these things write down as well. You know, when you're, when you're, getting set up with a strategy and we're talking about this stuff and we're saying picking the right underlying and I say, you know, it's less than, you know, 10 cents to the bid off, offer the right environment. It's got to be greater than uh, an IV percent. Let's do it this way. IV percent of 50 or 0 0.50, what, however you're going to come up with that. I'd say, uh, I just move, move it over to the 50%. The right duration is less than 35 days to expiration. 
strike location, we're looking at that 16 delta, all right? And I said max profit, 50% of your max profit. Well, when we're going through and writing all this stuff down, also say where you're getting out on your loser. Let's say, you know, if I sold the 55 strike, if it goes to, you know, $60, that's where I'm out, okay? Uh, draw those lines in the sand for yourself and follow. If you're writing it down like this, you are more likely to follow through and go back here and say, oh, I'm at 50% of my max profit. I wrote down where I was getting out. I'm going to get out at that location, all right? If you don't write this stuff down, you know, I've seen so many people uh, squeeze out a strategy a little bit longer than what they should. Uh, and all of a sudden, boom, the next day it comes back and, you know, they should have taken their profit, right? Uh, and especially for just a couple of pennies, it's not really worth it in, in my eyes to, to hold on to that for very long. All right. Your break even is where the underlying strike is. It's basically your short strike plus the premium, all right? So, you know, let's just say uh, I collected 50 cents um, on this strategy on, let's say the 50 calls, the 50 calls, I sold the 50 calls for 50 cents. Well, my break even is when the underlying is trading at $50 and 50 cents. That's at expiration, that's at expiry, all right? All right, so we don't wanna, we don't want to stick around that long for that, all right? We want to get out early on that. Um, so let's pull up the platform. This is usually where I throw it out to you guys. Uh, give me some stocks that you got. Somebody, JQ's already beyond me. All right, um, yeah, throw stocks out there in the questions box. We'll go over it and uh, look at some different scenarios. So. JQ is bearish on Beyond Meat. JQ, they got super low volatility right now though. So like a premium selling, I don't even have it over my thing. Uh, so we don't wanna really do that. Um, oh, it's an IV percent of 50? How does that work? Sure looks a lot lower than that. Um, all right, well, we could, either go with logic or not. Um, if JQ thinks it might, sometimes that math is off over there, but let's just look at it. All right, so it's an $80 stock, uh, 80. So we're looking at uh, less than 10 cents wide to the bid offer. I'm gonna take your word for it, JQ, that it's inside that. We could say that maybe this is the part of the yellow light. We're assuming they have an IV percent of above 50. So I'm gonna go out here and look at the calls. All right, so I don't got I don't get a 16 delta, so it's not always going to give you the exact delta. I usually will lean towards rolling out further because my probabilities are better. Right now, I only have a 13 percent probability of landing in the money, so that's pretty easy. Now, um, if we go and sell those 95 or sorry, uh, the hundred dollar calls. My break even is when it's trading at 184, if I sold right there at the bid, right? Um, looking at this, 100 calls kind of land there. Um, you know, you could throw up a uh, Fibonacci on it or whatever and say, all right, well, if it, maybe you would just say if it breaks above this, um, I'm getting out of uh, this strategy, you know, it doesn't matter where you say your out is, right? I could say, all right, well, I'm getting into this. I'm selling the short calls. If it breaks above this 58 Fibonacci, which I think is going to hold, then I'm out of it. You can get out of it whenever you say you're going to get out of it on the loser side also. Maybe some people that have a higher risk tolerance say, uh, you know what? I think it's a sell. Uh, one thing I am worried about, maybe the market wants to come and try and cover this gap. If it covers that gap, I'm out of it. Right, um, so that could be your out also, but make sure. I mean, I don't, I can't tell you what your out should be because that really has to do with your risk parameters. The out is uh, a serious uh, look at yourself and knowing what your risk parameters are and how much risk you're willing to take. So, on that, on the loser side, um, you're going to have to write that down. 
where you're comfortable getting out as a loser. Maybe it's a dollar amount or something like that. I have a friend that says if it doesn't start working out and uh, the same guy that only goes back six months on his implied volatility says, you know, if it doesn't, if it doesn't start working out in like five days, I'm out of this strategy as well. So, uh, you know, go with, if you're, trading directional with stocks and stuff like that, go with those same outs. If it breaks this uh, support resistance area, if it goes to this point, I'm out. Um, you know, all of those things will still hold true with your trading with options. Other than, you know, your exit strategy, you want to get out for, you know, your 50% of max profit. So uh, this chart could be off for some reason on that. I don't know why uh, it's, blowing out like that all right so with this one i would probably lean towards you know because it's got some movement to it i would probably lean towards rolling out to the 13 delta and only worrying about a 13 percent chance of being in the money at expiration so i would roll it out to that uh another one was uh was it costco or cisco cisco Oh my gosh, Cisco. Yeah, let's be bearish on Cisco. They came out and like even their investor call was like doom and gloom. Uh, it only has a 25% IV implied volatility, which is pretty low for, you know, you can see it got really low, but it, it seems like this is a bottomish area. Although, you know, if you believe that You'd have to be really bearish on this. And again, you know, you don't, you're not meeting the IV percent that I talked about of being above 50. Um, you know, just know that that is a, a, a glaring yellow light on this. But if you are super bearish, and I probably would be too after hearing those guys talk. Uh, the guy even, went, the C CEO went on CNBC today and was even talking about it. And uh, he tried to change the subject and talk about San Francisco football versus uh, the Eagles football with Kramer is <laughs> how, how little he wanted to talk about his company. So uh, that's very telling. And so Banu, I would, you know, probably look to do something here as well. Uh, I might, you know, if this really starts taking off to the downside, I might be thinking about buying puts instead because you know, if it starts really slamming out, you know, we got volatility crush happening. This is what volatility crush looks like. And that's because they just had their earnings and missed on their earnings. Um, <clears throat> actually, they beat on their earnings, but it had to do something with their forward guidance was terrible and all of that stuff. And I think they may have had some write, write downs that made it look a little bit better. And um, uh, so buying puts might be the thing to be doing there. Um, let's talk about gold. All right, gold. We've gotten this little bit of a bounce. We're starting to see implied volatility start to expand. It is slightly below 30. Uh, it was actually um, above 30 a few days ago when, when I sold uh, some puts in there. That's what I was talking about right here. And we've gotten that bounce. We got the, I had the volatility come out. It's still right around that 30, but... Um, you know, it's got some good premium in there. So we could go over here and look at uh, selling calls in there. I'm going to be looking at GLD, 35 days to expiration. It's 135 or $38 stock. So let's call it 14 cents. We go down here, look at our bid offers in the calls and in the puts just out of the money. Um, we can see that that fits that rule even after the close here. We don't have a 16 delta. So my choice is usually to roll out a little bit further. I'm just going to double check this, cross check what the strike location is to see if maybe, um, you know, I can find, maybe roll it in because there's a support there or something or sorry, a resistance area. Um, of course, I don't have a good chart up for it. So let's change, remove this chart, move that drawing. Hopefully I got my right Fibonacci's up. So let's just do a quick and dirty Fibonacci, if it's going to work for me, I'm not going to line it up perfectly. All right, so 146 is the high. We don't have a whole lot of Fibonacci's in and around that. We do have a couple of things on mine. Uh, it 
one thing to worry about for me would be that it goes back to this, which uh, this 141 or 142 area coincides with 1500 in gold. So we can see if we pull up uh, the gold chart, uh, that high volume node you can see here is like right in line with uh, right around 1500, which is where uh, it might want to go to. So that would be something I would want to keep an eye on. So I definitely want to get above that. I was looking at uh, the, um, so I wouldn't want to roll it in. I probably want to roll it out to the, uh, uh, the 15 Delta here. So 145. So if I said, okay, I'm going to be in here at 145, I'm going to be selling that 145. I'm collecting um, that 40 some cents, right? So 145, 45 is my break even. My, my out, I would probably say if I broke above this Fibonacci, that's where I would get out, right? And I would write that down. 146.82, I'm out, right? You know, if you have a lower risk tolerance and we sold those 145s, if it broke, you know, you might even say, okay, well, we're in a, you might, might say, okay, well, we've got lower highs and we've got lower lows happening here. We're in a bearish trend. You know, you could say if it breaks above this mark, you're out, all right? You could say, all right, well, there's a resistance line there. If it breaks above there, you're out, right? Just whatever you're saying you're out is, make sure you follow that rule, okay? I don't know how, if you guys follow charts or, um, you know, what you guys are normally looking at, but, you know, all of those things make sense to me. So uh, if you're trying to, look at that that way you know and you're saying it's in a trend and if it breaks above here then you're out of it or if it breaks above you know this area there then you're out you know all of those things make sense to me i have a higher risk tolerance i'd probably say if it gets above that that's where i'm out okay but i'm i'm looking to add this i just took off the puts like i said i sold them uh on the 12th got that bit of a rally i mean I sold them for 49 cents, bought them back for just over 15 cents, I think, today. And that was just a couple of days with, you know, that much volatility coming out and a couple of days coming out. So it went from, you know, just 12, 12 something to uh, down to 10 ish or 11. So it was one percentage point coming out, you know, and the directionality with the delta and all of that worked out for me. So, um, what were they? They were the 132 uh, puts that I had sold just a few days ago for like 40 cents. So I only got a couple of dollars move and that worked. So um, I'm looking to flip it now and do the same strategy, but on the opposite side. When do you use the puts? When I, you have a bullish assumption, right? Uh, on this one, um, when I was looking at the chart here, uh, you know, it just had a big move. And I, my theory is, is the Fed, despite the fact that they might not be lowering interest rates, are still going to be doing this non-quantitative easing that they've been talking about. They're not calling it quantitative easing, but funny enough, it's the same thing that they were doing when they were doing quantitative easing. Um, but anyway, so I felt like it was just overdone to the downside. You know, they're still trying to weaken the dollar, which should drive gold higher. Um, do I think we're in a recession? No, I've been talking about I don't believe that we are here in the United States in a recession. Uh, it's a global effort though, right? Um, so I was just saying, I think that it's just overdone. Um, now, you know, I'm a little bit worried. Let's just say my theory for the bearish assumption here is, is it came up and tested this Fibonacci or the value area high. Um, I think that it's going to struggle to get back to, you know, 141, which is coinciding, like I said, with the 1500-ish uh, in gold. I don't think that gold's going to go to the all-time highs anytime soon, but I do think that it might rally uh, a little bit. Um, but let's just say my assumption is, is I think it's going to peel back over. So uh, that's when I'm going to be looking to sell those calls. I sold the puts because basically on this day, I saw this like setting up and I was like, okay, it looks like, you know, this day it didn't get confirmed. I don't think I 
I don't think I got in on the uh, the eighth. I, Pretty sure I just got in a couple of days ago, but I might have gotten in on the eighth. I never wait for anything to get confirmed anyway. <laughs> I usually just look for the dojis and think, okay, it looks like it's starting to slow down on momentum and get in. Um, so if you ever if you wait for everything to get confirmed, don't follow my trades because I get in a little early. Um just like, you know, I'm going to be looking to get into this. Obviously, tomorrow, if we break above this Fibonacci, I probably won't be selling those calls right away. Uh, but, you know, if I was looking at this today, I was actually thinking about putting this trade on. But I don't like to do that when I'm I know I'm going to um, talk about it in a webinar and say, hey, I'm going to look to do this. I, I wait till the next day to do that because, you know, for one, I don't want anybody would ever say I'm trying to pump and dump a stock or any of that stuff either. So um, we'll see you tomorrow. But uh, that's that's what I'm leaning towards today is uh, selling some calls in GLD. Hopefully we can get a little bit more implied volatility. That's why I was thinking I wanted to get into this because it was the volatility was starting to creep up a little. Um, but that's what I would be looking at. The other one I did look at for for this webinar was uh, Coca-Cola, but Coca-Cola, um, there's no premium in those calls. Uh, despite the fact that it's an IV percent of above 50, I would not want to sell these for 15 cents. That's not worth it. I need more money than that for the risk. All right. Anybody else have any other questions? I think that pretty much covers it. Oh, shoot, I forgot to do the earnings, my earnings trades. All right. Um, well, while preparing for this, I didn't do my earnings trade that I wanted to do uh, in NVIDIA. Um, but anyway, uh, this is on earnings, how to trade option strategies around earnings. And like I said, I was going to do NVIDIA. I was going to play it to the upside. Probably should just not, out of curiosity check to see if I would have been right. Um, I didn't enter a trade in there, but I talk about all my rules for earnings specific trades, you guys. So if you like to trade around this earnings, it's great because you get in and out. You saw the volatility crush we saw in Cisco. That's what we're trying to take advantage of in these earnings trades. You know, you get that, you know, 99.9% .9 of the time that earnings are going to lose implied volatility after that event, because any binary event heading into a trial for drug stocks, volatility really expands. And then once everything's known, then volatility comes out. You're not scared anymore. Nobody's scared anymore. And all of that volatility comes out. Uh, I talk about how to take advantage of all of the strike locations, um, volatility, the duration in this earnings for options. So take advantage of it for 36 bucks. I show examples of, um, you know, I throw people under the bus in this that talk about how to trade options the wrong way. Um, and, you know, yes, they are giving you free education on mainstream media, but uh, they are also giving you bad information. They don't really care. They just want you to listen to them and, um, uh, you know, and they're, they're not allowed to talk about options the way I'm allowed to talk about options and be honest about them because they are trying to play to the masses. And I'm not trying to play to the masses in this. I'm just trying to play to logic. And, uh, you know, the regulators don't let them talk about some of this stuff. Anyway, without further ado, for 36 bucks, you know, yes, you do have to pay for something, but, you know, um, you're getting 10 hours of content. So if you've enjoyed this at all, if you learned anything from me at all, you're gonna learn more uh, in the, these webinars as well. So like if you learned, learned anything at all for 36 bucks, I think that you guys, uh, this is bargain basement for you. All right, so over 10 hours of content probably in that. Uh, I wanna thank you guys all different webinars. I'm gonna be drilling, drilling down on different option components when and where I find those appropriate. Again, here is the link. Oh, there is a link, I hope, to the entire audience. Let's see if I can, let me just paste it in there again because for some reason it left. All right, over there in the chat window, 
I have this exact link so you can click on that. It's a hot link, so it'll pull up a web browser that you have that you can uh, take advantage of. If you're watching it on tape delay, then uh, you'll have to stop, pause right now, and then punch this into your URL. If you have any questions, reach out to us at 310-598-6677. Email me at tradingatprotraderstrategies.com also. Hey, and if you guys have something out there you want me to cover, maybe it's, uh, not, I don't know what it is, but maybe you want me to cover something about trading, uh, throw it out there. I'll do videos on it. I even have videos out there on the ARB signals. If you watch the daily market commentaries, I'm always doing hand signals. I can't stop, but... My family always makes fun of me. Anytime I do a number, I'm doing ARB, <laughs> doing the uh, hand signals for whatever, even even months. I, I'll sit there and go in DEES, and I'll, I'll do the DEES December ARB signal for it. 25 years being on the floor, I can't get it out of my head. It's just, it comes natural. Um, so any of that stuff, uh, if you think of anything else you want me to do a video on, please let us know, because we're always looking to put out more content for you guys to make it more fun and interesting. Uh, like I said, take advantage of earnings with options. They are great strategies uh, to put on for earnings. And, um, you know, that's really where my bread and butter comes from is from trading options around earnings for the most part. It's the easiest ones as far as I'm concerned. All right. And then I also talk about if they go against us, you know, I'm talking about McDonald's went against me in the daily market commentary, how you manage that risk if it doesn't work out, okay? We go through that um, because they, all, they don't all work out for us and um, how we trade around that to lower our cost basis and all of that stuff to play that. Do you trade futures? I am a recovering futures trader, Manu. I do uh, on occasion trade futures. You can do these options around uh, futures. I mostly trade, 99% of my trading is stocks uh, and options on stocks, actually. Uh, probably, I'd say, pro let's say 90% of my trading is on options. When um, I trade around my stock, I do own stocks and I trade around those stock with options. So um, I also sell, you know, calls against my stock and you know, when I want to buy a stock, if I want to hold on to it and put it in my long-term portfolio, then I start to sell puts. Why don't you teach your futures basics? I could do something around that. You know, Fed fund futures. You guys want to learn about Fed fund futures spreading and probabilities and all of that stuff? <laughs> Maybe I'll start playing around with that for you, Manu. <laughs> and Meryl says, yes. All right. Well, we can talk about that. Um, I'll start, uh, peeling some of that into the, uh, daily market commentaries. What do you think? All right, cool. Sounds good. That's all I got for you guys. Other than if you can't take that, take it easy. Take care guys. Thank you guys. Bye for now. Later. You're very welcome guys. Thank you. And thank you for the kind words. Appreciate it. You're the best, guys.